Well, it is a pleasure to be with you. The last time I was, it was your opening Sunday, launch day. It's a lot of fun. And I'm glad to see the progress. And I'm really pleased to feel the atmosphere of the Spirit of God filling the house. Paul and Taylor, well done. Good job. Just good job. You all are some blessed people to have these as your shepherds. They are amazing human beings. Come from really good stock. I know his mom and dad really well. His siblings, know all of them. Most of them are part of our church. And Paul and Taylor were a great blessing to us while they were participating in grace for over a decade. And we were pleased and sorrowful to send them out. And that's the combination that you need to have. That's the only recipe that works. Meaning when you send somebody out, you ought to be happy that they're fulfilling the will of God, but you ought to be really sad they're not going to be next to you every Sunday. It ought to feel like that, this duality, this pulling of the soul. If you ever have to send somebody out and you're only happy, <laughs> you get my point. It ought to be both. And there's both all the time because we miss him, we miss her, we miss their pull, we miss their love, their relationship, the everyday moments, the weekly moments, we miss all that. But we are really happy, in fact overjoyed about what's being produced here. And we gladly sacrifice all the joy and the, the intimacy we had in order to produce this. It's worth it. Thank you for participating in this mission, in this church, and I believe God's going to do many more things beyond what you presently see and beyond what you can presently believe. Turn with me over to the book of 2 Timothy. I'm going to talk to you today about leadership development and what it means to train next, to train next. 2 Timothy Chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 12 through 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Paul is penning this, and he says, For this reason I also suffer, suffer these things, but, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standards of sound words which you have heard from me, and the faith or in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Lord, help us as we study your word. Paul is writing to his favorite protege, Timothy. And he had a couple. He had Titus. He had Epaphroditus. Uh, he had his traveling companion Silas for a minute. He had Barnabas. But Timothy was probably most close to his heart. Uh, he found him on one of his missionary journeys. His mother was a Jewish, his Jewess. His father was Greek. And Timothy was about 17 years old when he accompanied Paul. Paul actually asked his parents, could I have your boy? And that was pretty much the way somebody got started in whatever career they were, they were aspiring to, is that you became a, a pupil of a mentor. You became somebody who was actually a protege. And you pretty much lived out your life with them. It wasn't like we do it today, where you had a matriculation system from kindergarten through high school, and then all of a sudden you went to college. Most people learned to trade. This was going to be Timothy's. Paul thought so much of Timothy that he really considered him his son. He calls him his son in the Lord many times. And in fact, in this letter and in the previous letter, 1 Timothy, he does the same. Sometimes he's so affectionate he calls him his child. Now, it wasn't natural birth, but it was spiritual. And I'm not quite sure that there needs to be the distinction of emphasis one over the other. I have a beautiful natural family, one in which I grew up, and then one that we've established between my wife and I. And I love all those people with all my heart. 
But the beautiful thing about God is that he creates us in his image. And there is no capacity, boundary, that you can find for God's love. He can love all seven and a half billion people without being distracted from one against another. Without feeling like, oh, I don't have enough to to really dispense for you today. He's that big. And he made us kind of like that because we're made in his image. Meaning, you can have a natural family that you love a lot, but you don't have to, to, to diminish your love for them to add more. Your spiritual family can be just as important to you in different ways as your natural family. And to Paul, though we don't have any record of his natural family, we do have some some kind of allusion to the idea that he was probably married. It doesn't say so in Scripture. But in order to be a Pharisee, and he was a Pharisee before he met Christ, one of the general rules was that you had to be married before you could be ordained as such. I imagine there were exceptions, but that was the rule. And if you were going to be really moving up the ladder of success, you wanted to be the example of what a Pharisee should be. And there's no question that Paul, before he met Christ, was moving up the ladder of success with respect to what it meant to persecute the church and to represent pharisaical values. So we have every reason to believe he was married. Yet, when he gave his heart to Christ, people thought he was a heretic. And generally speaking, if you were a heretic, either you were stoned, meaning you no longer believed in the Judaistic faith, or you were cast out from your people. And then it was sometimes the responsibility, if not the obligation, of the father of your bride to come and take her back. So he may have lost his wife as he went into his Christianity. We do know while he was a believer that he was not married because he talks about that he wishes everybody was like him in 1 Corinthians 7, unmarried. So we don't know a whole lot about his natural family, but we know a whole lot about his spiritual family. And Timothy was one of his boys. Now, the interesting thing about this letter is that it's one of the saddest in all of Scripture. A lot of good information that we can learn from, we, we, can, we can glean from and understand how to govern well, what it means to be a, a leader, even though you feel like you are the youngest person in, in the eldership group that you really don't have enough gray hair to be able to talk to people who do? Mm, this is really uncomfortable for me, but God placed me here. <laughs> I remember what it was like when I was a, a young pastor, uh, 30-something. I'd, I'd go to the grocery store and, 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 and meet people, and, and I'd start ministering the gospel just to anybody I possibly could because nobody was coming to church. I had to go to them. <laughs> and and, and as, they, as they begin to understand, so, so are you a minister? Yeah. Oh, you so young. Yeah. I, I remember what it was like to not feel very respected because I didn't have enough years or gray hair to commend me. And here's Timothy in this environment trying to figure out as a young man. And we're talking about young, probably in his late 30s, early 40s. Not real young, young, but too young to be leading people who are old. And so the disrespect that folks would have toward him was pretty high, especially when he got Paul. I mean, <laughs> what big shoes. Who can stand up? Paul was all that. He created the, the theology we have today. He, he's the one that, that coined the idea that Gentiles and Jews ought to be together. Nobody else had that thought. Nobody in the Jewish community. In fact, Peter was the one who had to be convinced that it was important for us to even be thought of as being included, that we might be targets. And he was reluctant to do that. Paul really was the initiator of the entire thing. Not to mention what it meant to, to establish government, elders, deacons, how you do it, what the qualifications ought to be. Paul set all the standards for church. How are you going to follow that? I mean, I'm junior in every way you can possibly be, Timothy would say. And he's trying now to lead this church at Ephesus 
That's where, where Timothy is when Paul writes this letter. This church at Ephesus, we believe, is somewhere on the neighborhood of 20,000 people. And here's a 37-year-old trying to figure out how to make it go, and, and he's insecure, and he needs his mentor. But his mentor is in jail. Paul is writing this from prison, a prison out of which he would not leave. He was on the way out permanently. It's not that he would expire in prison from natural causes. He would be beheaded. And he realized this was the end. The end, not of his ministry, but of his, his physical life on earth. His ministry is still going on today, and we are the recipients of it. As a result of the letters he wrote and the influence he had in the church, the same kind of ministry he had went on to such a degree that now the church is defined by Gentile participation. How about that? Remember, for the first 20 to 30 years, 90% of the people who were in the church were Jewish. But now we have to flip it. God can reach Jews? Wow, that's amazing. Look at how many Jewish people are being saved. Everybody was Jewish. From mid-30 A.D. to mid-50 A.D., just about everybody was Jewish. Paul was on the cutting edge of bringing us into this thing. And his influence has been felt to such a degree, as I said before. But he realizes he's not going to make it out of this prison. And he's doing his best to try to write some things that are last words. And the person to whom he wants to communicate most is Timothy. Why? Because every dad, every responsible person that has stuff that they feel like they probably shouldn't die with wants to give it away. And Paul is trying to find somebody who can inherit that which he has. Oh, the Jewish tradition of making sure your children were around before you expired so that you could give them their blessing. Started, we believe, with, with Jacob and his 12. Probably was a tradition way before that. But as he was about to expire in the latter part of Genesis, he brings all his boys before him. And he begins to talk about every one of them. And the inheritance they're going to have, the blessing, the prophecy, the difficulty. It's an amazing moment. And it's a, it's a moment that every parent wants to have with their, their sons and daughters. Sometimes most of us don't know when the end is. And so we need to prepare a little bit way beforehand. Maybe do a video presentation. Something they can log on to and say, this is what I meant to say before I could go figure it out. But this was Paul's epilogue. This was his will and testament. These were his last words. The problem was this. He couldn't find Timothy. Oh, he knew where he was. He knew he was in Ephesus. But it was one of those for Paul. Where are you? I got your address. I know your number, but I can't find you. The whole letter is, why are you ashamed of my bonds? What happened between us? How come I'm in prison in Rome and you haven't, you haven't come to see me? I'm not, I'm not going to get out of this. And you're the one I've invested more in than anybody else. And I can't find you in these last moments. What am I missing here? And over and again, he says, don't be ashamed of my bonds. Don't distance yourself from me now. You need what I'm about to give you more than you know you need it. You might have some skills that I've been able to train you in. You may have even, even become accustomed to the culture of leadership whereby you've had to navigate through all of your insecurities in order to prove that God was really moving through you. You may have had a, a, a moment where you feel more comfortable than ever and that you really don't feel like you need me anymore. But I want you to know there's stuff you don't have yet. Where are you, Timothy? Come and get what I got for you because I don't have anybody else of kindred spirit like you. 
I need you next to me. But the problem seems to be this. Now, we don't know all the details, but I'm conjecturing here. And I think, I think I'm probably right. He says, don't be ashamed of my bonds. Well, why in the world would Timothy ever have cause to be ashamed of Paul's bonds, considering the fact that he was Paul's traveling companion for like two decades? And he saw Paul beaten all the time, thrown in jail. Paul ministered somewhere between 25 and 28 years. One-tenth of that time he was in prison, at least. So you're talking about two and a half to three years he was in prison. One out of every 10 days, that man was behind bars. He never went to a place. Maybe it was the unusual thing. But we have in Scripture, every place he went for the most part, Trials and difficulties awaited him. Nobody laid out the red carpet for Paul whenever he went someplace. People met him with stones, <laughs> beatings, d- 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 jeering, disdain. It was hard, primarily, because he was working with virgin territory all the time. It's not like he would always go to a place where there was a church. He was reaching people like us where there was none. It didn't exist unless he started it. And those people had an idea about how to already reach reach their God. They were idolaters. And Paul was coming in, not only dealing with their false gods and the religion that was worthless, but he was dealing with their economy, not, not directly, but indirectly, because when people no longer worshiped false gods, they didn't buy idols anymore. And so now, all these people who had set up their entire life on false worship with respect to their own business, they weren't, the statues were sitting on the shelves. They hated Paul. They beat him, threw him in jail, did everything they possibly can to try to destroy him. In fact, one time they stoned him. Now, stoning was the, the main instrument of execution for the Jewish community. And it, it's been my practice, maybe you know different, than, that when, 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 it, when the government chooses to exercise uh, the, the right to execute somebody, generally they're pretty successful. I'm not commenting on whether it should happen. I'm commenting on the fact that when it does, I haven't seen anybody survive. I mean, those who wind up in the electric chair, don't get out. Those who have lethal ejection, don't survive it. So when Paul gets stoned, generally speaking, the people did their job. In Lystra, he got stoned. The disciples said he, to them he was so dead that they took him outside the city, it says, to bury him. And when he got outside the city, it was one of these. (laughs) Woo, that was rough. (laughs) He got up and went back in the city. Who is this guy? This was Paul. Now, what I believe happened is that God said, you're not done yet. I can't let you die. But he may have been dead and God raised him. I don't know what happened. All I know is that they put the mirror up to the nose and there was no fog. Took him outside to bury him, and he survived. He had difficulty every place. Why in the world would Timothy now choose to distance himself? I think it may be this. There was a time where he was going to go to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20 and 21. And... uh, Everybody was really concerned because they knew if you go to Jerusalem, those are all the people who really don't like you because you turned your back on on your Pharisee career, Pharisaical career. And now you are a living testament to everything they hate. You go there, you're going to be in trouble. A man named Agabus, who happened to be a prophet, I think it was in Caesarea Philippi, says, I see the man going to Jerusalem bound with his hands like this. And he tied his belt around his hands. And they're not going to treat him well. 
To which all the church said, Ah, yeah, the Lord has spoken. Now Paul's not going to go. This is great. Thank you, God, for speaking. The prophet has said it from the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's been warned. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to keep our apostle. To which Paul says, So, he said, All you've done is you, you, you tweaked your dial and tuned in to the station I listen to all the time. Every place I go, the Holy Spirit tells me, persecutions and endangerment await me. It doesn't stop me. To which, I think, people thought, he doesn't use a lot of wisdom. There are a lot of places he can go where people would like him now because he's established a lot of churches. But he goes intentionally into harm's way. And it just doesn't seem very wise. So by the time he's now in his last imprisonment, I think the mindset of the church was this. We told him. I mean, what's new? Eh, This is what Paul does. He goes where he's not supposed to go. God warns him, and he goes anyway. And then he gets in trouble, and then he expects us to bail him out. I don't know that that's the case, but it's the only thing theologically and pragmatically I can think about that would make his son say, I'm not even going to visit you. And make Paul say, please come. But if he does not come, Paul gives him some good insight about what next looks like. He says this, I know this, that even if my words are falling on deaf ears, I know my God is able to guard that to which I've entrusted him. That even if you don't take everything I give you, he's able to. I don't need humanity to try to figure it out for me. I know my God is my advocate. And every day of my life, I entrust him things that I know he's able to keep, even if humanity does not. If he doesn't raise up you, he's going to raise up somebody. If this generation chooses to leave the stuff of value on the ground rather than burying it down in the midst of their heart, God will raise up somebody else that will not trample underfoot that which is a treasure. I I trust him. He's able to keep that which I have given him. Oh, gosh. Every leader needs to have that in their heart, that if God has given them a vision or a dream, Even though men are important to the process, they are not critical to its success. We have to trust God every day. I've given my life, my occupational life, my relational life, my entire breathing to all I know true about Washington, D.C., my church, and my extended family called Every Nation. For 38, 39 years, I've been living the same thing, doing the same thing. And people have come in and out of my life. And I've loved every bit of it. The joining and relished in identifying with Christ at some point, even in the pain of loss. Understanding that Jesus couldn't even keep his own staff. (laughs) Why should I be any better? All of that I identify, I find, I try to find God in the midst of it. I didn't say it was fun. I didn't say it was my choice. But I have no choice in this. I'm his servant. And I don't think I can fare much better than Jesus. All of that I've given my entire life for. And I've entrusted things to people in hopes that they would be able to live beyond me and be more faithful than I ever was. Yet, I cannot trust in man alone. I can't just hope that they're going to hear it right and do it right. They're going to receive it the way they should and then pass it on to the next generation. I cannot trust that man is going to do it the way I think it needs to be done. Though I train as best I know how. I have to trust my God is bigger than all that. Bigger in every day. The what he has privileged me to architect and be a part of because he's built it. All I've been is a worker. What he has privileged me to be a part of that he's going to sustain. Paul knew this. He said, I understand everything I'm saying is beyond you. 
I believe that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him. And it's not only the vision that, that Paul had, it's also the people. I don't know that, I don't know that any, anything bothers adults more than the idea that their children may not be what they hope. If our friends don't become what they hope they will be, whether it's the friend who hopes for something for their friend or whether it is, it is actually the friend, there's some disappointment, but there's, okay, they'll figure it out. But when a child goes left when they should go right, there ain't no pain like child pain. Parents go through sleepless nights. Back of their brain, where did we go wrong? How did this happen? Oh, Lord. And in, in fits of spiritual panic, we think the sky is falling. And we forget that God loves that human being more than we do. And we begin to make some draconian moves. I, I haven't heard one amen on this point, and I'm not quite sure <laughs> what that means. But maybe I'm just talking about myself. We make draconian moves. These radical things. Oh, uh, uh, give me your phone. You're grounded for a month. Stay in your room and I have the key and I'm locking it. Amen. <laughs> because we feel like we are ultimately the most responsible for their well-being. And I've overreacted many times. More times than I'd like to, to think. My wife, <laughs> Cynthia, is just, she's so great. She is always like this. Always. I'm like this, like this. Like I, I am just Mr. Emotional when it comes to whether my kids are going to do right or not. She's cool. She never gets, not even a, not even a little blip. No, just, 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 just. And I've learned not only through watching her, but understanding my Bible, that God, you're able to guard what I can't. And so I choose to trust you now and not be what I used to be. I change so that I don't become that because when I become what I just talked about, I'm no longer a very good witness of who God is to my kids. I'm now the frantic, anxious person who doesn't trust God to watch over my kids, and they innately understand that because I'm, I'm overreacting to a situation that God has. Paul understood the idea of trusting God. And every leader, whether you're mom or dad, or whether you are leader of a church or a business, you need to entrust things to God because he's the only one that can keep them really well. The second thing is that as a result of understanding that <clears throat> God is the one who can ultimately keep things we can't, there are some things we need to keep. He says, I want you to retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me, both in faith and in love. If you're not going to come, listen to this, Timothy. Retain what you have heard. Hold on to what you know to be true and retain the standards, not just the words, but the standards that have been built by those words. There are some things you need to keep. There are some people you need to keep. There are some standards you need to hold on to. Things that you are listening to from this pulpit need to be retained by you and taken in your heart. What did David say about the word of God? He said, the law of the Lord is dear to me. I love it so much I've decided to hide it in my heart. Literally place it in the vault of his soul. That I may not sin against you. And the word sin there is not just to do something abhorrently wrong. But it is also to miss the mark. To not be on point with that which you desire me to be. 
And so I want to make sure, Lord, that I don't veer left of the things that you're commanding me and exhorting me and inspiring me to do by making sure that these commands and standards are down here, not just up here. There are some things I hold on to dearly that give me architectural confidence. And everybody needs to be thinking about building something. It shouldn't be just every day you're waiting for fresh inspiration for, for, for you to do something that might be productive today. There ought to be a plan someplace. Okay, I'm going to say amen for you sometimes <laughs> because you're, you're just missing all the good opportunities. There ought to be a plan someplace. Thank you. There ought to be a plan that you're putting in a place that you follow. And th these plans give you good, 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 good structure and let you know where you shouldn't stray. And there are five things, values, that we in our every nation world hold on to. And, and, and through these five things, we run everything. This is how I run my church. This is how I run my personal life. And that way I know that I'm on point. One is the Lordship of Christ, obeying him. Not just asking him to save me out of my stuff. I love him as Savior. Oh, oh. Without it, I would not be here. I need him to be my Savior. But if I don't regard him as my Lord, I'm taking advantage of the benefit without paying the cost necessary to receive the benefit. Now, it doesn't mean that I can work for my salvation. I can't do that. But to respect the one who has given it to me is one of the things that is, 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 it's, it's endemic to worship that if he is Lord and he has given everything for me, then I need to respond to who he is, not just what he's done. And honor him for his lordship and choose to obey him every day. My obedience does not get me any more accepted than I am presently, but it does get me more approved. Acceptance comes in spite of us. He saves us and loves us not because of what we've done, but in spite of what we've done. He disregards all of it and gives us the opportunity to not only be forgiven, but to be included in the family. What a blessing beyond compare. And for that, I'm grateful for him being my savior. But if I only accept that which comes from his hand, I'm shallow in my worship. I have to accept all of his person, which means I need to acknowledge him as Lord of my life. Ruler, master, owner, controller, and respect that lordship as being more than a title in my life, but a, a, a responsibility to now observe with my life. Every day, with my thoughts, the words of my mouth, the actions of my life, you are my lord. Secondly, evangelism. As I grow my church and, my, and, and, and I'm trying to figure out my life, I want to make sure that I'm not just growing with good Christians. I'm really not looking for folk from other congregations to come be a part of mine. In fact, that is not my target at all. My, my general rule is when people come from other churches to come visit us, I say, welcome, glad you're visiting. I hope you enjoy home well. I'm not trying to get them to stay. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't bring, it doesn't add value to the kingdom. It, it, we pastors talk about church growth and many times all we're doing is taking fish from one aquarium and putting them in ours. What about the vast sea of fish? I'm depleting somebody else's portion of the kingdom in order to increase my, where's the kingdom increased? I got to go out and win those who aren't in the aquarium. Evangelism important to me, not because it's my, not a, a part of my profession, it's because I'm a Christian. I love reaching the lost. I care about the lost because I used to be one of them. Secondly, once I get them in, I disciple them. Discipleship. Help them to understand what it means to be a disciplined follower of Christ. After that, I do, do what I can to help them to be a good leader. Now, the capacity of leadership is different for everybody. Some have huge shoulders and, and, and a massive uh, ability in their soul to be able to handle a lot at the same time. And they can grow into something bigger than, than, than either they or I thought about. And then some don't have that same capacity. Remember Jesus talked about this in the parable of the talents. One had five, one had two, one had one. 
Each were given a talent according to their ability. Now, the talent word itself does not mean uh, some kind of singing ability or playing ability or running fast. It is a unit of measure. And a talent was 100 pounds of anything. So when the master went away, in Matthew 25, I think it is, it says he gave each according to their ability. 500 talents of something, one, 200 talents of something, and another 100. Each according to how they were able to manage it. Me? Eh, I, I consider Paul the 500 talent guy. I mean, 500, 500 pounds. He was a 500 pound guy. Uh, okay, let's say Philip, who was a deacon, he's a 200 pound guy. Two talent guy. I'm probably a quarter, someplace in there, and I realize my capacity. I get it. I'm, I'm not what other ministers are. I'm not mad about that. I'm just growing into whatever God's called me to be. My goal is this, to double whatever I got, because the one who had five gained five more. The one who had two gained two more. The one who had one decided to bury it and squandered his opportunity. That I don't want to do. So whatever capacity you are, you need to make sure you bring increase to the kingdom. That is leadership development. How are you going to bring leadership to places where there is none spiritually? <clears throat> then we've got family. Family's the last. Oh, gosh. To produce spiritual family takes a lot of work. A lot of work. And to make natural family work well takes an equal amount of work. And so if you do not have a mindset that allows you to incorporate what family looks like, then you act too much like an only child on a regular basis. And God has a lot of other brothers and sisters he wants you to connect to. Amen. So those five things are the things that help run my life. Family. Leadership development, discipleship, evangelism, lordship. If I do those five things and I don't do anything else, I'll be pretty satisfied when I get to heaven. If I do those well, I'll be all right. There may be a, a lot of things I neglected, but that's okay. Not anybody can do everything. I got those five. When we talk about what it means to retain things, those are the five things upon which all of our every nation world is built. And if you want to be a part of how we do what we do in terms of building congregations and leading people and planting churches and doing campus ministry, those five things help you know what you should retain. Now, if you do it, it doesn't mean you're any better or worse than any other Christian. Our every nation world is just another part of the body of Christ. There's nothing more special about us than any other part of the body. But there is something that God has called us to do that he hadn't called other folk to do like we could do it. And so we've got to be faithful with that to which God has called us. And those five things, along with planting churches, doing campus ministry, being socially responsible, and making sure we do world missions, that is our mission statement. Those five values, those four mission statements help us stay on point. Those are the things I retain every day. I bleed them. I pray them. I live them. And then lastly, he says we need to guard. Guard through the Holy Spirit. That which has been entrusted to you. Guard this treasure. I don't know that there is anything more valuable after salvation than what God has given you to fulfill in the earth and the people to whom he's tied you to do it. I don't know. And I guard that. The only reason he didn't take me to heaven when I got saved is so I could preach at victory on the 29th of September yeah. in 2019. Now I'm overemphasizing this moment, but I hope you get my point. There's work I needed to do. There are people I needed to help. There's a kingdom I needed to help construct. There are things I needed to say. There are leaders I needed to develop. There are people I needed to have with my wife. <laughs> 
You don't laugh either? I mean, you guys, gosh. There, there's stuff I needed to produce in the earth. And that stuff needed to remain. Now, there's a lot of stuff that I did in the meantime, all the way through the process of trying to do that which I was called to do, that fell off. Yeah. And you figure out that what you're supposed to do and that what you're not supposed to do. It's a process of growth. You try this. Oh, that didn't work. You do that. Oh, that worked. And then you whittle your life down. If you continue to live well, you whittle your life down to the thing to which you are most called. And you give the lion's share of your life to that. There will never be a time when ancillary things don't need to be done. But every day of your life, the lion's share of your time, resources, and talents need to be given to that thing that you are called to do. And you must guard it. It is a treasure for everybody else. You are a treasure for everybody else if you hold on to your calling. There's something you can do that nobody else can and you need to guard it. You need to protect it. You need to cultivate it. All those things that you must retain, you have to guard. Because everything will try to come and distract you from it. The devil will even give you some good stuff. It won't be just temptations to do bad. I mean, think about it for a minute. As I close, here Jesus is, 40 days out of the wilderness, fasted, all 40 days. And the first day ending his fast, he can end it. That means he can eat. The enemy comes to him and says, huh, if you're the son of God, turn that stone into bread. Now, innately, was turning stone into bread sinful? I mean, it was obviously within his power. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. And I don't see a command. It's not one of the ten. Can't turn stone into bread. There's nothing innately wrong with that. Secondly, he's hungry. And when you are 40 days fasting, especially probably as fit of a man as he was, it, anybody, anybody fasted, like not intermittent fasting when you just missed breakfast. <laughs> I'm talking about real fasting. You know, that like three days and beyond or two days and beyond. You, you get hungry. But the kind of hungry you are then is not the kind of hungry you are at 40. Your body is, is literally dying at 40. Because you, you've gone through all your fat resources. You've gone through all your muscle resources. And now you're eating organs. That's all that's left. And your body is, is screaming beyond decibel comfort for food. And the enemy knew exactly where to hit him. Turn the stone into bread. You're, you're super hungry, aren't you? Jesus had the presence of mind to say this. <sighs> yeah, you know, man shouldn't live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, not you. It wasn't evil to turn stone into bread. It was evil to do it at the inspiration of anything that wasn't right. Jesus was able to discern that. He said, I'm guarding my heart. Guarding my heart. Sometimes the enemy will give you good stuff to be a distraction to the best. You have to guard stuff. If you want to be a good leader, you're going to have to guard some things. Everything's going to try to come and steal it from you, distract you from it. You gotta hold on to it. And if you hold on to it long enough, and you are a good steward of it long enough, you will have fruit in the earth that follows you. Not just what you produce in terms of character and by your own hands. I'm talking about people. How do you live the way you live? Can I come to your house just for dinner? Cause like, I don't know how to describe it, but like, I think God's there. <laughs> You, you like your family, you, you pray, and your kids are, I didn't grow up with any. Of, can I just come and, you don't even have to feed me. I just, I just want to sit in the chair and just watch. All y'all, I won't say a word, just be a fly. Just, I've never been 
in anything, people will follow you. Because you understand what it means to let God guard. You understand what it means to retain. And you understand what it means to guard all of the above.